Hey guys, hope you're all doing well and if you've been keeping up with the channel, you'll know that I recently picked up this Surface Book 2 and what better way to test it out than on my trip to Combitex in Taipei. So from typing scripts in cafes, editing raw photos in Lightroom to creating 4K videos and exporting them on a deadline, did the Surface Book 2 give me everything that I needed? Well, the model I've got here is the 13.5 inch 256 gigabyte model with the performance base and that'll set you back around $2,000 US. For that amount of money, you'd expect this thing to be all sunshine and rainbows out of the box and it mostly is, but if you're going to be pushing this thing to its absolute limits like I am, you'll definitely want to know the ins and outs of this thing and also a very important performance tweak. Now there were a couple reasons I had my eyes on the Surface Book 2 as opposed to other laptops and one of the main specs which were non-negotiable was the 8th gen Intel CPU. The performance improvement over 7th gen is just far too nice to even think about buying one without it. So here we're going with the i7-8650U, a quad core CPU with a boost clock of up to 4.2 gigahertz, but we'll talk more about that later. And this one has 8 gigabytes of RAM, which which for what I'm doing, I've found to be absolutely fine. Just make sure that you don't have a ton of programs open at once. Before we talk about performance, let's go over the basics. To start off, the build quality on the Surface Book 2 is easily up there with the MacBook Pro in my opinion. I'm a firm believer that the user experience doesn't just stop at what CPU or GPU is built into your device, but extends onto other overlooked features like the feel of the keycaps and the texture of the palm rest, for example. And if there's one aspect of the Surface Book 2 that I'd absolutely preach about, it's definitely the overall build and design. It's rigid, there's zero flex on any areas and every time I grab this thing to do a little bit of work on it, it really is a pleasure to use. There's no plastic at all apart from the keycaps of course, but everything else is finished off in this nice metal. The base material is ideal in my opinion. It has that precise machined look, which I love, and the finish isn't as cold or harsh on what you'd find on a MacBook Pro. The hinge is definitely an interesting feature as well, and at first I've got to admit that this was a feature that I wasn't super excited about. I definitely preferred that closed laptop look, but I do appreciate appreciate that this thing is different and so far there's been no dust or dirt or anything like that been getting stuck inside those gaps. It is a top heavy device seeing as it is a two in one with the CPU built in behind the screen. But in terms of screen wobble, I personally haven't noticed anything while typing or gaming or editing. But of course, if you are going to be using a stylus to draw on the screen, I think it's fair to expect the screen not to be entirely rigid. There aren't any fans built into the CPU portion of the device, but I believe that may be different for the 15 inch version. But otherwise, both the 13 and 15 inch version have a fan built into the GPU portion of the device in the performance base with the exhaust airflow between the screen and the keyboard. Now these are quite loud full blast, so if you are going to be utilizing that GPU during a 3D render or maybe while gaming, just keep in mind that they will ramp up to a pretty audible level, otherwise the device is completely silent with normal use. And the keyboard feels excellent to type on compared to something like the MacBook or MacBook Pro. I definitely prefer the keys on the Surface Book 2 since they have a little bit more key travel and require a little bit more force to actuate each key. Backlighting is okay, it's not perfect and it does look a little uneven on some keys but it's not something that most people will notice. Most of all, I don't feel like the keys get oily over a day or two's use which is a problem I've had with other laptops. I really wish that Microsoft made a keyboard with this exact same layout for desktops as I would pick that up within a heartbeat. Trackpad is decent too. The buttons are probably a little harsher than I'd like, but I really do appreciate that they're built in underneath. Otherwise, the Windows Precision drivers feel snappy and responsive, and I do find that the surface area is big enough for me personally, but I'd still like to see it scaled up to match what Apple have done with the MacBook Pro. Okay, so let's quickly talk about that screen, and if you're a content creator like me, you'll be pleased to know that this thing is among the best out there. It's got a resolution of 3000 by 2000, so plenty of room to work with there. The colors are calibrated from factory, so you know out of the box that you're getting something that's ready to go. And on my device, I'm getting 423 nits of brightness, an sRGB color rating of 99%, and an Adobe RGB color rating of 81%. Skin tones look accurate from what I can see, but most of all, colors are true and not oversaturated. I understand that the bezels are kind of thick compared to what you'll see on a Dell XPS, for example, but you honestly get used to it, and I don't consider this to be a deal breaker. Port selection is good enough 
enough for my use case with two USB 3.1 type A on the left side, a side of the SD card reader, which by the way was absolutely non-negotiable for my use case. Please take note Apple. And on the right hand side, you'll find a USB 3.1 type C and the proprietary charging port. I hope they keep this port for the next revision as well and don't cave into the few complaints that they've received. Most of all, I love that it's magnetic and just super easy to use. You can also charge via the type C port as well if the charger has enough power. So just keep that in mind. For battery life, I'm getting about nine to 10 hours when doing tasks like editing photos, web browsing and writing scripts. So pretty much a whole day. But if you're going to be video editing and playing games, don't expect more than about four or five hours in high performance mode. This is because although it's a 15 watt U processor, it can turbo up to 35 watts for a couple seconds at a time, and it can sustain 30 watts if there's no thermal limit reached. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. One thing I did notice though, is that if you are going to be using it plugged in and in high performance mode, you will notice some coil whine. It's kind of annoying and the reason why it happens is even more annoying. When in high performance mode and not charging, the CPU will adjust its frequency depending on what tasks are being processed as it should. But as soon as you plug in that charger, it decides to boost up to four gigahertz even when it's doing nothing at all. It's kind of annoying, but you can pretty much get identical performance by using it in better performance mode when plugged in. So this is what I personally opt for and recommend if you find that coil wind too annoying. Now, one of the big reasons that you'd buy the Surface Book 2 over something like the Dell XPS 13 or 15 is that this is also a quad core 13 and a half inch tablet. and using it as a tablet is simply awesome. You've now got a device that is slightly bigger than an iPad Pro, yet a lot more powerful, running a desktop operating system, and it's now in tablet mode that I appreciate a decent bezel size as well, as I can now hold the device without touching the display. I use this as my main media device now for when I'm catching up on my favorite channels, and I also use it to refer to my scripts when talking in front of the camera. I'm not a big fan of teleprompters when it comes to YouTube, as I feel like it makes it feel less personal, but having this thing off to the side is definitely handy when remembering talking points. And lastly, speakers are good enough for general use and music that doesn't require a lot of bass. They're towards the top of the screen and off to the sides. Of course, for video editing and gaming, you'll probably want to use that headphone jack, which is annoyingly located towards the top right of the screen, which makes for hanging cables. Obviously, there's a lot of circuitry going on down towards the base though, so I can understand why they've done this from an engineering standpoint, but Microsoft, if this is possible to move it down to the bottom, I think we'd all appreciate that. Okay, now let's talk about performance and what you can expect if you're going to be pushing this thing to its limits. First of all, if you're going with the 13 inch model, going with the performance base on the Surface Book 2 is absolutely a no brainer, as otherwise you may as well go with the Dell XPS 13, which is a great laptop and you can save yourself a bit of cash. Here we're getting a fully spec GTX 1050 and we'll talk more about gaming performance a little bit later, but the main reason a dedicated GPU was such an important spec for my use case was the benefit of CUDA acceleration in apps like Premiere Pro, which makes editing and exporting videos an absolute breeze. This combined with Adobe's latest update to utilize the integrated GPU on Intel processors makes for very fast export times. And I would argue that I could comfortably run my entire channel from this single device if I really needed to. Over at Computex, most of my videos were about five minutes or so given the type of content, but they only took about 10 minutes or less to fully encode the video in H.264 with effects and have that file fully ready for upload. Timeline scrubbing and video playback is fine with a native 4K file from my Sony a6300, but if you are using heavy color grading layers and effects, video playback as you would expect isn't the experience that I'd be getting from the overclocked 8700K in my desktop. In pretty much all cases though, I do prefer to work with proxy files anyway, as this allows for flawless timeline performance no matter what color correction or effects I throw at it. And overall, this results in a much faster and more productive editing experience. For those who don't know what proxy files are, they're basically lower resolution files that represent and are synced to the original file. So you're able to edit a lot faster and without any hiccups in the case of the 720p Cineform proxies that I personally use. And then it still encodes the original 4K clip for the exported file. 
And the great news is, is that encoding the proxies on this thing is an absolute dream. Again, thanks to that iGPU boost that we talked about earlier, I honestly can't tell the performance difference here between the Surface Book 2 and my high spec desktop PC. So video editing performance is good, but we can make it a little bit better. Let's start by talking about the thermals. Now, as I said before, the CPU in the 13 inch i7 model that I've got here is the quad core i7-8650U, which is said to be a 15 watt processor, but can boost up to a consistent 30 watts in the Surface Book 2, which can become a problem under certain loads. The first thing you need to know is that there's four power settings on the Surface Book 2 when it's not plugged in. And these are battery saver, recommended, better performance and best performance. Now I went ahead and benchmarked each one of these in Cinebench R15 and monitored the power usage in Intel's XTU to get the best idea for which one is best for me. The battery saver mode does exactly that with the 8650U only consuming about eight watts, peaking at a temperature of 43 degrees C and giving us a lowly score of 326. Stepping up to recommended now, the CPU peaks at 53 degrees whilst consuming 11 watts, resulting in a score of 348. With the better performance setting, the CPU is now granted up to 14 watts during the benchmark, hits 58 degrees C and gives us a slightly higher score of 359. Note that the CPU clock speed is still below two gigahertz for all three settings here. And it's not until we bump it up to the best performance mode that we reach above three gigahertz. The score now sits at a much improved 664, but notice that the CPU is now consuming 30 watts and hitting a thermal limit of 91 degrees C about midway through the benchmark. This is where undervolting comes into play. So booting up Intel's XTU software, I did manage to run a stable V-core offset of minus 110 millivolts, and the CPU is able to boost a much higher now at 3.5 gigahertz and for a much longer period as well, resulting in a score of 747. Do note that the CPU is still eventually hitting that thermal limit at around 90 degrees, but this thermal limit isn't a concern for any other apps that I'm running. If it is a problem, you can adjust the turbo power limit from 30 watts down to about 20 or so, and that will fix your thermal issues. I did get a small boost in export times here while running the undervolt, but only by about 22 seconds since the overheating was only present for short moments at a time. This CPU undervolt is also a great idea to run for gaming as well, seeing as things do get pretty toasty there too. In Witcher 3, for example, with an ambient room temperature of 20 degrees C, the CPU would hit upwards of 80, whereas the GPU would sit comfortably at 65. So there's no need to run an undervolt for the GPU in my opinion, unless you're going to be using this as your primary gaming device, which let's be honest, is probably not a great idea from a price to performance standpoint. While the Surface Book 2 with a GTX 1050 can game, you'll want to stick to light titles and of course, lower that native resolution of 3000 by 2000 down to something more reasonable like 1080p or 50%. Overwatch plays fine at 1080p with high settings, Fortnite played really well also with a resolution scale of 75%, but titles like Witcher 3, which are a little bit more demanding, will need to be dropped down to something more conservative like 1800 by 1200 if you want playable frame rates. The bottom line is it definitely can game, but you'd be crazy to buy this thing solely for gaming. So wrapping up this review, it's hard to say anything bad about the Surface Book 2, apart from the thermal issues out of the box and the weird coil wine when plugged in, and even the weird headphone jack, I still think this is one of the best Windows laptops out there and definitely the best two-in-one from what I can see. It can edit 4K video, no problem at all. Uh, editing 24 megapixel raw images from my Sony are no issues either. And then for uh, light tasks like web browsing, uh, general media consumption, and even writing scripts, uh, it really is such a pleasure to use because it is such a well-built device. So for anyone in the market for a high-end laptop, these are my honest thoughts on the Surface Book 2. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that it's something that I'd highly recommend. Uh, yes, it's expensive, uh, but there's nothing out there currently that can do everything uh, that this thing can do. It really is a very versatile device. And uh, when considering that a dual core 13 inch MacBook Pro is, you know, not too far off the current price of what this thing is currently going for, I think the uh, pricing for the Surface Book 2, at least for the 13 inch that I have here, uh, is fairly reasonable. And so if you've got a Surface device or something similar, let me know down below what your experience has been. As always guys, a huge thanks for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you all in the next one.